and welcome to another episode of Half Hour with Astra Theater Company. Uh, I have a very special episode for you today with an artist who is not from Kansas City, but is incredible. Um, she is an amazing artist and a fierce activist and a dear, dear friend of mine, the one, the only, Ari Krebs. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Taylor. Hey, how are you? Oh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. How are you? You know, um, I'm living and I'm healthy and I'm employed. So those yeah, are all good. To be grateful for. Yes, I'm trying to uh, practice some gratitude. Yeah. Um, what you been up to? Um, well, I mean, it's been it's been a quite quite a quite a year. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have I, no idea what you mean. Yeah, no, nothing at all to tend to. Um, uh, well, in the start of 2020, I was I was doing a show uh, at Roundabout called Dar Darling Grenadine in the in the underground space, and it was this lovely, beautiful, buoyant little intimate musical. Then we got cut off by uh, the Rhone, and only by a week though, so that was that was not too heartbreaking. Um, were you into your extension? So we just we we were scheduled for a one week extension, and then did not get to perform the extension. Right. So we we did perform our entire uh, originally um, projected run, which was which was wonderful, and you know I learned so much from that cast. They were. Ugh, Phenomenal actors, phenomenal, directed by Michael Bress. Yes, incredible, incredible, incredible work. You were stunning, gorgeous. You saw it on a crazy night. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I don't remember. Um, <laughs> you don't have to reveal if you don't want to. I was supposed to be zipping up a dress, Emily Walton's dress. Um, I was playing her best friend backstage and I was supposed to zip up her dress and then she goes into this whole solo number that, um, that uh, she's like performing her ass off, like running about the stage, which is in the round, by the way. So it's like the worst time for a, a, a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> so the dress, the zip goes up, but the dress doesn't close. Um, so we're sitting there, I'm like, hey, uh, there's, a, you know, there's something wrong with, with your dress. And she's like, oh, well, should we go fix it? And I go, yeah, she goes, let's get out of here, <laughs> run off stage. I don't know, she might be so mad that I'm telling this story. I can check with her later. We run off stage, we're like, oh, God, what do we do? Cause she's gotta, she's gotta go back on immediately to perform an entire number. Um, and you know, the, the band stops playing cause we didn't give them the cue line. It's like, it's <laughs> worst series of events. You could, if there was any suspension of belief in that moment that what happened wasn't supposed to happen, it was, it was it was over so we're like oh god and we're, they're just like the our um our costume person backstage is like trying to our wardrobe person is trying to like get the zipper to fix we're like she like throws in a couple of stitches but the dress is like stretchy so it's like <laughs> it looks like a bunch of keels in the back and then she jumps on and she does the whole damn song like a goddamn pro i will say in the audience it was not that no i mean obviously i noticed it but it was not like this like chain reaction of like well, the show's canceled. It was, you know. <laughs> I also say like the show kind of lends itself to that quirky like behavior, like the way that it was written and directed. It's very like light and charming and and quirky. So um, it was fantastic. You covered it like a professional. Oh well, you know we live we and we we live and we learn and yes. uh, we look fondly back upon the moment that we don't have to live in anymore. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what else were you doing uh, after that? Um, so after that, the world shut down and I was like, wow, okay, well, it looks like no one's going to book anything for a while. Um, but I actually was in development for this incredible uh, short film that is to become a part of a series about stage managers called Thank You Five with Marin LaBelle, who you know, mm -hmm. and Matt Steiner. Um, and we had been developing that kind of through the course of the beginning of the year. And ended up being able to shoot it during quarantine um, just and early on in the process but was it was very safe you know we all had our masks when we needed them um, and uh, we kept the crew super tiny we all we had was sound sound hair and makeup um, uh, a DP who was also just handling all the lights and doing all of like the grip shit you know that was Chris Harrell yes um, and <clears throat> and um, a couple of actors and it was it was totally crazy to do in the time but it was like 
it was it was really exciting. It was my my second ever film project, uh, and um, yeah, I kind of got to co-create that with Marin and Matt, which was really really exciting. Um, yes, and- their fledgling film company, One Eyed Rabbit. Yes, One Eyed yes. Rabbit. That's very cool. Uh, when do when will the film come out? Um, I'm actually not sure, but everybody should follow One Eyed Rabbit um, sure. and my other short film if you're interested in learning more about the project. And uh, I did get to get a peek at the final cut, and it's really exciting. I, it looks beautiful. The editing is mwah, still delicious, and 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 Keith Barratt scored it, and it's like this mm. beautiful original, like jazz. Oh. Oh, that man is divine. He he can make some really beautiful music. So. Yes, he can. Lucky. Um, the way that it all comes together, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So um, stay tuned for that. I think that they're hitting, gonna try to hit the festival circuit. So we'll see how also like how film festivals are going to be <laughs> post plague. <laughs> Post plague or yeah. during plague because it doesn't seem like we're going to be post plague for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Our country. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Um, yep. No, we can't pay people to stay home. So you know, we're just gonna it's gonna keep on keep on raging on until we act responsibly. We'll see what the new administration is able to do um, with that. Yep, until we're all um, vaccinated as well, which will also be probably by spring or summer. So. Yeah, yeah, so we'll what see. What a great little carnival ride 2020 has been. I remember at the beginning of this year, my dumb ass was like, it's going to be a renaissance. It's going to be like the roaring 20s. I was so young then. <laughs> Dude, I know. Yeah, what a freaking disaster. But every, but the beautiful thing is that all the writers have been writing. Mm, mm, so I'm mm. so excited to see like what, um, creatives have been up to during this. I mean, granted, if, if they haven't been writing, that's also okay too. It's very important for us to emphasize that like we are not machines despite the um, the effects that capitalism has upon us. And I uh, just yes, constantly ma'am. trying to stay ahead of productivity. It's not necessary. If you are a writer and haven't been writing, good for fucking you. I hope that everyone is taking good care of themselves. But I do, I, a lot of people I know personally have been really like, using this time to yes, take care of themselves and also create things that maybe they haven't had the time to create. Totally. And I'm really excited to see the fruits of that. Um, Me too. Um, okay, so Ari, let's learn a little bit about you. Um, what you were born and then what happened. So where are you from? Um, when did you start like performing? Like when did you realize that performing and the arts were kind of your jam? Yeah, um, I saw my first musical when I was, I think, six, and I was living in Philadelphia. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia. I was living in Philadelphia at the time with my parents, and they took me to see Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat at the high school, um, uh, the high school that was connected to the elementary school that I was that I was at, and I just sat there like this the whole time. <laughs> And I was just like, at six years old, was just like enchanted by the magic of live theater, which I'm still enchanted by the la- magic of live theater. There's nothing like it. I'm just mm-hmm. like, will never not be romanced by the idea that, you know, y- you show up to a theater, you sit down in your seat and you get to watch all of these individual art makers come to the story with what they have today. Yeah. And it is, you'll never get the same thing that that's the magic of it to me is that like it's so um intangible it's it's just one one little dew drop of a moment and it could be different every night one night it could be a perfect flawless maybe boring performance and the next night your dress might not zip up correct (laughs) you know and then the next night you might have an actor who's coming in with some some pain or some some exorbitant joy something brilliant might have happened them today and being able to bear witness to that like moment in time I feel like um I just have so much respect for actors in terms of what they do and how how actors are able to just like bring themselves as an instrument to the art and especially in the theater to do it eight shows a week is like Olympic athletes Olympians um yeah it's When did you like realize that, that this was something you, that was like for you? Like, when did you realize this was something that you could like study and like make a a livelihood? 
Um, well, from the moment that I saw that show and my parents picked up on how much I adored it, they just like kicked it into kicked it into overdrive in terms of supporting me and and fostering a small theater, their own version of a musical theater education. Um, <laughs> And like my dad would go to the library every week and pick up a different cast album and then in the car and we'd keep it in the car. So like, that's how we learned our musicals was just like whatever they had at the library and what my, whatever my dad was like drawn to, he'd pick it up and then we would learn the show together, we'd sing along and like pick out who our favorite um, artists were, who our favorite actors were. That's how we, f we both fell in love with Marin Maisie um, from listening to the Ragtime album. Uh, so your so your dad is also like a big fan of the arts and theater. He loves musical theater. He loves it, and he loves play. I mean, but he he really has a special space for musical theater. He only works out to musical theater. <laughs> so like, catch my dad at the LA Fitness in Jenkintown, PA. Like, just <laughs> elastic. Like this. Also, this man. Like he does. He's like the type of person who will do like ninety minutes of cardio. <gasps> I know it's I couldn't even possibly fathom such a thing and he's like 90 minutes of, of like the he's like busting out to the ragtime prologue or like he I think Wicked is on there too like he loves well good thing the ragtime prologue is 90 minutes so he'll need <laughs> <laughs> um well did he like the the arts and live performance before or did you guys kind of foster that like love and knowledge and education of it together I think he liked it. And there were a few shows that my parents knew about. Um, like my parents knew about Phantom. I think Phantom, Little Shop were a couple and maybe like Hairspray were ones that they were like, oh yeah, that's musical. But I don't think that they were particularly like hyper passionate until um, I was, they discovered that I was so into it. And it was like from, I can't even remember a time when I didn't think I was going to be an artist when I grew up. I think I, I read my like my first grade bio yearbook bio that recently I think I like stumbled across a photo of it in my bio. <laughs> it said, um, I want to be on Broadway by the time I'm 21. <laughs> Miss that one. Lofty goals. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to attend either um UPenn for musical theater. They don't have a BFA in musical theater. I think they have a BA or so a BA in theater, but like I, they don't have a BFA in musical theater. But I said that because my dad went to UPenn and I was really excited about that. Or Juilliard for opera. Opera. First grade. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So from a young age, you were like, this creativity was sort of like just exploding out of you. And you're like, I don't really have anywhere else to put this except for this thing that I now love yeah. with every fiber of my being. Yes, exactly. And what's, it was like, it was, I'm totally one of those kids who's like, theater saved me. Because I grew up, um, uh, I lived in Philadelphia for like the first seven years of my life. And then my parents moved us out to a tiny suburb called Jade Town, um, right outside of Philly. And, you know, I have, I have like a, a beautiful, beautiful, like small community of friends who I've held on to and like I adore and look fondly upon our relationships. But overall, it was very hard for me in that environment. And I was bullied a lot. Um, I was just like this kid with a lot of extra energy, definitely hyperactive, probably a strong bout of ADD and just like didn't know where to put it when you're a kid. Um, and my parents like were, I don't, they never took me to get diagnosed or anything like that. And I, they, they don't, I just think they didn't think about it that way. And I'm grateful. Um, and I think theater was a big way for me to cultivate my own community because, you know, freaking weirdos are in theater. It's like I found people <laughs> who were like me who wanted to be loud, who were empowered by being loud and crazy and um, taking risks and just like, you know, that like full unabashed self-expression that was yeah. so hard for me in school growing up. Um, it was like, I found a home for myself for that version of myself in the theater. And it yeah. was so funny because in gr the theater program at my school was like, so <laughs> they would give me all of the leads because they knew that it would be fucked if they didn't give me the leads because I was the most passionate about it. Right. All of these outside extra classes, it's not even like I was the most talented. It's just like I was working the hardest. I was school. on time. I knew my lines. I made everyone shut up during rehearsal. <laughs> yes, a little bit of like a little bit of behavioral policing from the person who's the most serious about theater. Um, 
but you know, it was really important to me. And I always had this issue because, you know, they had like the gifted programs for the kids who had the higher IQs or whatever. And they like would take them out of class to go and like spend special time together because they're smarter than everybody else. But then when you had a, a, a young student who had promise in performance, I remember my first, my, one of my first days of music class in my new school in Jenkintown, because in my, in my, um, my old school in Philadelphia, I had this amazing music teacher. He loved me. He's like, you're gonna be an opera singer when you grow up. He like totally encouraged me to be myself. Mm. But then when I, uh, I got to my first day of class, music class in first grade, I was so excited because I was like, I'm a singer. Like, you know, they're singing like, I don't know, some, some dumbass like, I don't know, <laughs> kid or something. The lyrics are on the sheet and the woman's playing the yes. piano. And this woman looked at me and, and, and she pulled me aside and she said, hey, you know, so that, um, you know, there's a shaky thing that you're doing with your voice, this like shaky thing. She's like, don't do that. It's not good. And she was talking about my first grade vibrato. <laughs> which, you know, might have been vibrato artificial. Vibrato policing. Vibrato policing. And this woman told me, she's like, don't do not do that. It's not good. And I remember going, and that was like, like seven-year-old me, like just singing my little heart out. And this woman's like, no, vibrato, bitch. So I remember being really hurt by that. And it's you're like, Marin Maisie says otherwise. Marin Maisie is, <laughs> God rest her soul. Yes. Oh. Broadway did not do right by her. She deserved more. Um, yes, she she told me differently, and that's how I learned. But um, yeah, so she was she was not uh, in any way nurturing to me. Constantly trying to make me smaller so that the other kids didn't feel bad about the idea that they weren't as passionate about singing and didn't try as hard. I don't know. Like it's I. I, we, we did Annie in the sixth grade and she, she, I remember she pulled me aside and she was like, stop her, essentially told me to stop performing as hard as I could because this quote wasn't the Walnut Street Theater, which is the biggest regional theater in Philadelphia. And she was like, it's making the other kids like. Look bad. Was, yeah. I, and I probably was total shit in the sixth grade. Like what the hell? Like, I, it's not like I was like extraordinarily like specially great. Right. Um, but I just was, I just loved it so much. And these, I had these teachers who just did not want me to love it and did not want me to succeed. Same thing happened to me when I was in high school. I had this choir teacher, I, we, were, we were doing friggin, um, what's it called? Anything Goes and I was <laughs> Reno Sweeney. Oh my God. <laughs> I would murder to see those tapes. I'm, I'm emailing your mom. <laughs> One, day. <laughs> One day we can, uh, we can, we can get some libations. So hopefully you can get out words and we can watch it together um but I remember we were singing blow Gabriel blow and like she kept telling me that just essentially was telling me not to try as hard and not to like add all of these I would go I would go and work on it with my vo vocal teacher privately and like prepare it and bring it in with all these choices she's like take all those choices out don't sing it like that and like I would just and then I remember just like singing the whole song like this soul crushed <laughs> yeah that's it and I was like oh my god okay uh. The next day in rehearsal, I like get back out there and I like do my thing the way it was. And she yelled at me and she was like, that is not how you sang it last time. Why are you doing it like this? And I'm like, because I'm an artist and I have friends <laughs> my mouth. <laughs> well, <laughs> jokes on them because here you are, you know what I mean? Crazy motherfucker. But for some reason people started to smell what I was stepping in. <laughs> It's not that hard to smell. It's very strong. It's a strong smell. <laughs> so strong what smell. what was your like, um, what have you been up to like recently creatively? Like how has the pandemic impacted that? Have you been able to do anything creatively uh, aside from the short film you were talking about earlier? Yeah, actually, um, I've gotten to, I've gotten to do work on two other projects in quarantine. One of them was, um, I was lucky enough to be selected for the ABC Discovers showcase, talent showcase, the New York showcase um, in the summertime. And then that was supposed to be over by October, but obviously because it was remote, there were so many different things to iron out that we kept pushing the time. And then luckily for me, I just got to spend time with all of these, like this company of incredible young artists. Like I, like Taylor, I'm telling you, I literally just received my acting education. <laughs> Courtesy of ABC. Yes. I, I honestly like, and they, they, <laughs> not a dollar was paid. I'm not, this is not an ad. Like I just, 
And yeah. I certainly do encourage like any young actors who are, who are trying to like get into it, please submit for this showcase. It, it really, I, like literally my life changed over the past several months. How so? Um, I, the way that, we, you know, we started out, I had no idea I was gonna, I didn't think I was gonna book this thing. Like so many people submit. I was like, ah, I've gotten a couple of callbacks in the past and like, great. I'll just like, they'll get to know me and my callbacks and then hopefully call me in for things later. Ended up booking it and then meeting all these students. And the first thing they do is drop you into like a 16 hour crash, crash course in TV and film auditioning uh, with Ted Slaverski, who's this incredible TV and film coach. He, 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 um, he coaches Rachel Brosnahan on the Maisel stuff. Like he's, he yeah. like really is, he's been in it for a while and he knows what he is doing. Um, <clears throat> and we all just dropped in. We were in class every day for a week. Um, working on different material, uh, you know, comedy, co-star, series regulars, pilots, sh all just learning how all the technical aspects of how to do well in those auditions. And then we went into a scene selection process for the showcase itself, which ended up lasting several, a couple of months instead of a couple of weeks, which was just like, completely worked in my benefit because I was just constantly cold reading all of these different original scenes with different scene partners from my cast and also getting to watch them sometimes um, mm. in class and it going in cold like that it, it seems at the time I was like this is miserable I'm not doing well I'm not ex excelling in any way but fundamentally it was just about practice and it was a muscle I had not like learned how to exercise and I was getting dropped in with these like incredible comedians who've like been doing this forever the, the guy who ended up being my scene partner this guy Woody Fu everybody should look him up he's a fucking genius he's so smart he is so goddamn funny and he is like a, a sketch comedy guy, like UCB. He's like yeah. been doing the thing. He's an amazing improv artist. And um, the first time I got into a breakout room with him to read, I was just like, oh my God, this guy does not use a single word on the page. <laughs> <laughs> he just makes up his own ass shit. And it just forced me to be a better actor because it forced me to not be so concerned with the words and just to like pay the fuck attention. And yeah. then he just like, he's this machine of beautiful gifts for comedy. And, you know, once I just start, realized, I was like, okay, I just gotta listen to him. And then also he kind of like made me think, you know, I can make up some shit too. And then all of a sudden I'm just like learning how to be funny yeah. for the first time. And also being like a crazy ass motherfucker and just like being out there and eccentric and all these things and, um, you know, we had like a, a midterm meeting with, you know, the, all of the folks at ABC and uh, they were like, what do you want to work on? And I was like, you know, what's really important to me is like, I have a musical theater background. I didn't get a great acting education. So it's just really important for me to like focus in on what I like, what, what, what I need to work on is like not being too much, being grounded. You know, I want to learn how to be like small and nuanced. Mm. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I, I'm afraid that my musical theaterness is going to get in the way or, you know, I, I've had a lot of people tell me that I'm too much in college. Every eval was just like, you're too much. Um, I had a, I had a teacher tell me in my junior eval that my performance was if Mary Testa had just um, drank three Red Bulls and done four lines of Coke. Really constructive feedback. Yeah. Yeah, so I was all also over like, I would kill to see that performance. Mary Test is a genius. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, I would love to see her with three Red Bulls and with a couple of lines of coke. I'm sure it's absolutely <laughs> remarkable. But I always had this like baggage of like, I am too much and yeah. certainly too much for TV. If I was too much for musical theater, I was too much for TV. So I told them that and they were like, oh my God, no, bitch, be yourself. They were like, we believe every second of you, whenever you're being crazy, whenever you're being like, mm. whatever you think is bad, they're like, we love it. We eat it up. We think it's such a, it's so honest. It's all, they were like, we never don't buy it. It's because, all a breath of fresh air compared to everyone. Cause I'm sure that many people have been told that they're too much. And for you to continue to let that shine. Yeah. Also of just a quick pin, like as an artist and an actor, especially if you're just an actor on a project being told that you're too much or to tone it down is like the most excruciating thing in the world because you're like oh fuck what about me was too bad because if you're too small it's easy to be like oh they just need more 
but if you've already given too much and they're just like, Ooh, something about that is like everything about who I am is. <laughs> so triggering. It really is so trigger. And cause it's, you're being vulnerable, you know, you're, you're, you're just offering everything that you have. And usually it's a case of kids just, or kids, not kids, artists, just trying to, you know, do their best or like offer, offer every ounce in their being to this story. Totally. And, you know, when I talked to the folks at ABC, they were like, oh my gosh, you got to get that out of your head. They're like, we love who you are, crazy and all, you know, we, we, we never don't believe you just keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and I finally was like, oh, that's enough permission from important enough people for me, unfortunately, to have my own sense of self-worth now. Um, and it wasn't enough to have it on my own also because I had these like traumatic experiences like always growing up and through college of just constantly being too much for people. And then to have these like folks who are casting really fancy actors and really fancy high paid projects tell me, no, 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 this is gonna work for you. Just keep doing it. Do you think that people telling you that you're too much like th that experience that you've had unfortunately throughout your young, young life and into your like college education is because people have not necessarily encountered someone that looks and acts like you, like they expect something different from you? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's always a battle or it has been a battle and hopefully now it won't be, um, you know, thanks to ABC and I was able to build a, a team of rep representation from the showcase that is excited about who I am, everything that I am. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> who are gonna, you know, help me, help me to offer that to the people who are interested. Um, but absolutely, it's been like an uphill climb my entire career so far of, of knowing that when people give me an appointment based off of my headshot, I'm gonna walk in and they're gonna have to like take a quick 30 seconds to like process the fact that they are nothing like what I, they imagined me to be. Mm. Um, and like, because I'm tall, because I'm curvy and like, because I have a lower voice or like a bigger voice. It's like, people will see my photo and be like, oh yes, a nice, like uh, a nice, like uh, ingenue Asian, because that's the only space that Asian women have, in, especially in the theater. Um, and then knowing that I have to go in, I, the amount of appointments that I've gotten for the wrong role. And I know that I'm going in for the wrong role where I'm just like, all right, I'll just do these sides and hope that they have the capability to stretch their imaginations past like what archaic archetypes have traditionally been upheld by white American theater. Correct. And sometimes it does work in my favor. Um, the show HUD that I've been working on, um, I was not originally, I did not originally audition for the character that I play. Um, and I went in with the sides and luckily in that instance, Mark Brokaw, the director, he was like, you know what? I think that we really want to have you read for this other character. And in that instance, they had so much faith because the, I, I looked down at the breakdown for the character that they wanted me to go out in the hallway and come back prepared with had a Scottish brogue. And that's not something that you want to prepare in your five minutes. <laughs> outside sitting in the hallway at Pearl Studios like right. so like I'm over there like Scottish accent like trying to listen to like what the fuck it sounds like I go in and I totally blew it like it was awful it was a sad 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 display and he was like yeah you can just use like any do you want do you have cockney like do you have any just like not as high class accents and I was like uh yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> Thank God they gave me a call back and gave me a shot to prepare it. Yeah. But it's not how it always works. You know, sometimes you go in and they're like, oh, yeah, no, she's not what we thought. Oh, that's a lot, way too much that we expect from an Asian actor. Um, and that's, yeah. Yeah. I hope that the industry that is like um, bringing up and cultivating these young artists and trying to like springboard them, their careers is like, meeting the like influx of creative projects that are helmed and feature like diverse populations whether that include like sexuality gender or race like off the top of my head I'm like you would like be so perfect in like a pen 15 or like in a you know what I mean like these projects that are now like cold not even cold classics like 
I think what I'm trying to say is that the entertainment industry is so hungry for something new, but the yeah. people running it don't know what that is. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah. And that's why w- this is like the beauty of we're living in the age of actors getting their acclaim and then creating their own fucking production companies like Aquafina. Like, I don't know if you've seen Nora from Queens. It's my new favorite show. I need to watch it. Um, um, I'm obsessed with I May Destroy You. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Best show I've ever seen in my life. And Insecure, these like people who traditionally haven't been given space to tell a nuanced story with them at the helm creatively and artistically in, featured in the piece now have the resources to be like, boom, like this is what it looks like to tell these stories and make space for people who look like me yeah and the rest of you have to have to deal with that and then they can hire all the writers that they want and they can hire the people they can bring on the producers that they want who they know are going to cultivate a safe space for these artists and then hire all the artists that they want to hire like create a, a, a writer's room without a white person like that is that is, I'm very excited to see what we're going to get from all of these actors who are like, I made my money, I now made my production company and like, just you fucking wait. Those are the rooms that I wanna work in. Amen, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything that you're working on now or in the coming future? Um, and where can we find you? We have to begin to wrap up on Forge. No, that's that's totally fine. Um, the last project that I got to work on in, in quarantine is this incredible <laughs> short film titled Pink and Blue. Um, and it's 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 uh it's featured by Doug Bossy Productions. You should all follow Doug Bossy Productions. Um, and it's a it's a it's a very queer film. It's about a trans and gender non non-conforming couple who are black and Filipino and they have an accidental pregnancy. And it's about how they want to bring this child into the world without gender. And it's, it's- Juicy, thought provoking. Okay. My partner, Carmen Labu, um, directed it. And we actually got to film it in our house, which was amazing. And, and, so and cool. it's, it's like, oh my god the film is absolutely incredible i got to play a, a very small part in it um but that is a project that i am so excited about uh and yeah i think that's that's pretty much it and now we're just like now we're onward that's amazing um well keep us posted on what the future holds for you and uh have a happy and, and healthy holiday okay you too it was so good to talk to you again yes we'll talk soon all right all right take care